Just hop right into it, Mr. So, Santosh. Excellent. All right, welcome everybody. This is uh, noon time in San Francisco and another round of inbound-led outbound webinar. So today we are gonna have a debate or should I say battle of ideas between Clark Barron, the defender of data privacy and Adam Robinson, our uh, high growth entrepreneur. So here's how we're gonna run this uh, debate. So we'll start with an introduction. Uh, Clark, you are our special guest here. Uh, both candidates will establish their initial position on data privacy. And then I have six or seven topics or segments of this discussion. So I'll, I'll try to run through. In between, we'll have a few polls to get some uh, input from the audience. And we'll try to get Q&A from the audience in the last 20 minutes of this hour long discussion. Clark, Does you sound... should be flattered. You should be flattered. We prepared way more for this than we have for any other show. <laughs> we got we got polls, we got questions. We, this, Fair this enough, be... yeah. yeah. Yeah, we're trying out some new format here, Clark. All right, with that, uh, uh, could you introduce yourself? And with the, your introduction, if you can present your uh, initial position on data privacy, both US, EU, you can add uh, uh, whatever uh, around that. Yeah, sure. So my name is Clark Barron. I'm the CEO of Ronin. It is a marketing agency that exclusively deals in the cybersecurity and infosec space. Um, I'm based in Huntsville, Alabama. I'll give you kind of the, the rundown of my stance since uh, Adam has always uh, already said so clearly that he is the polar opposite of, of my perspective in, in pretty much every way here. Uh, when it comes to privacy, our audience um, assumes that there is a level of anonymity and tools like our B2B, and, and of course there are others, um, are, are completely shirking ethical responsibility that we have to our audience. And you, you can't necessarily cheat your way to the front of the line. And there's a huge difference between valuing your audience and actually respecting them. So regardless of where this falls on uh, the scale of legality, whether or, or not uh, concerns are growing or not, we can debate that for days. Um, the, the primary basis for my entire uh, platform is that we can do better. Thank you, Adam your initial position. And can you also add why you decided to do this uh, webinar in the first place? Did I yeah. answer that? Yeah, yes. yeah, you answer that first, Clark. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'll be more than happy to jump all over that. Uh, considering uh, everyone seems to think that I'm here for the clout or to piggyback off of uh, Adam's audience. Uh, I can assure you that when it comes to things like security, data privacy, cybersecurity, uh, there are those of, out, uh, those of us out there that do the right thing just because it's the right thing to do. So uh, I'm here to add more to that conversation and to hopefully educate uh, those of you that might not be familiar with the ramifications uh, that using tools like this uh, would have on your relationship with your audience if you're trying to actually build a long-term sustainable brand. Thank you, Perfect. Adam, over to you. Okay, so um, my view on this whole area of study is um, primarily people are allowed to have differing opinions on this and there should be a discussion, which that kind of leads into why I wanted to have Clark on. Uh, I'm not trying to hide anything. And as you can tell by everything that I do, uh, that's just not what I'm all about. I'm a free speech guy. Um, I want you to hear everything that Clark says. And if you agree with Clark, I don't want you using our B2B, right? Um, so uh, that's number one. I want to actually let his message flow through, through this platform rather than block it. So, um, and I think probably Clark agrees with me on that. Like we're totally aligned in that and then everything else we disagree on. <laughs> so, um, you know, the the position I have on, on RB2B specifically is that, um, I'm a law abiding citizen. So are all of my customers, you know, to the extent that this becomes illegal, uh, we will not do it anymore. I will not be selling it. I will be doing something completely different. 
Um, I don't believe that uh, I have any obligation to adhere to GDPR just because it exists somewhere else in the world. I'm American, our tech's American, our data subjects are American. And then when it comes to the actual tech, we are logging data and enriching it in a very similar way uh, that countless categories of technology on the internet log and enrich in different ways data. We're logging IP and cookie information, security applications log IP information of users, uh, you know, tools like Hotjar log uh, mouse clicks at people. So, um, you know, my position is that this is a new use case of logging and enriching data. Uh, and that's where I stand on it. Uh, it's legal, so you know we keep doing right. it. Thank you, and we'll we'll do a deep dive on different aspects uh, of this in the in the next few minutes. But Clark, let's start with R B two B. You have mentioned that R B two B is a legal nightmare. Can you elaborate and let the fireworks begin? Yeah. So it's. It's not necessarily that it is a legal nightmare. I, I want to clarify something real quick. Um, Adam has said things like, I have said that RB2B should be adhering to GDPR, uh, even though you don't live in Europe and neither do your data subjects. Um, I've never said that. To suggest as such would really make me look super ignorant as to, uh, my entire point of view when it comes to data privacy. So um, you can call it whatever you want, technically legal, legal for the time being, um, whatever uh, the case may be. Um, when it comes to uh, it being a legal nightmare, I 100% th believe that it has the potential to be a legal nightmare. Um, Adam has stated on several occasions that he believes that, you know, future generations are uh, going to look back at conversations like this and think they're completely ridiculous and uh, has, for some reason, failed to acknowledge the absolute uh, growing concerns around data privacy. And to this date, the only thing that I've um, been able to uh, discern from any information as to why or any evidence he has to substantiate that claim is that, uh, well, I've talked to some people. Um, when um, Gartner and Cisco and uh, Kensington, everybody out there is stating that privacy concerns are going through the roof in B2C, uh, consumer goods, online, whatever, um, as well as in, in B2B. And so I'm really having a hard time grasping um, how you plan on substantiating those claims when every piece of analytical research out there says the direct opposite. So Adam, uh, do you want to uh, respond to Clark's query? And yeah. we'll, we'll take a deeper dive into some of the other aspects of what he said. I, again, like th this is just like my my opinion, right? Like I think those organizations are run by a bunch of boomers, and like the the younger generation doesn't care. And, and by the way, like that's not why I'm doing this. Like, uh, it's not because uh, I, I just I just don't feel one way or another about it. I, I feel like I'm an enabling a use case that is slightly different than a bajillion other use cases that exist in tech. And singling this one out is like a bit ridiculous in the context of how ubiquitous all the other stuff is. Uh, but that, that you know, Gartner also says that Sixth Sense is awesome, right? Like everyone knows it sucks. So uh, I, I just don't, you know, I, I don't think that they have a crystal ball. I don't think that they can see the future. I think that they're just sort of pandering to this, uh, you know, whoever is lacing their pockets uh, at the moment. And it's people that care about privacy, uh, probably um, directing attention to certain parts of privacy so that they can get away doing some far more ridiculous things. Uh, that, that would be my guess. <clears throat> so let, let me take this conversation to... So so the answer uh, is no, you don't have any evidence to support that. Just so we're uh, other I than mean, that's but, your opinion. Oh yeah, it's it's totally an opinion. Okay. I mean, when I say like, I think future generations are gonna look back on this and 
and think it's a ridiculous conversation. That's just me suggesting that that's what I believe, right? Like, um, you know, it, yeah, like, look, you, you create a product like RBDV and you're going to have some people that really don't like it. And that's, you know, you and Oracle and, you know, Gartner and whoever else is talking about this. Um, that's just a, Great. the world that I live in. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you yeah. have to. You're you're monetarily incentivized to. Yeah, I mean, you know, true. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, Clark, here's my question to, and and I'm just trying to uh, in the next few, uh, couple of segments, I'm just doing a deep dive on data privacy. Do you think security companies and fraud detection companies are a privacy nightmare? like RB2B. And, and here's why um, I'm trying to understand uh, why your position on security companies are not the same, right? Because um, they use the exact same data. They do ID resolution the exact same way that we do. Uh, in fact, we buy from data from same vendors that are selling to all the security companies. So advocating that RB2B is an ethical nightmare uh, for legit demand gen use cases would get these fraud detection and security companies out of business as well. And are you okay with that? Differences in intent. What do security companies do with that data? What does our RB2B do with that data? Both of them are helping their customers. I thought well, you were- Why is the intent I, different? It completely depends on what you mean by help. If if okay. you mean if you mean help as in give them a level of uh, identification for their users beyond uh, like the company level, then if that's how you want to define help, sure. But a, an argument could certainly be made that uh, that the complete opposite is true, which I'm sure we're going to get into, well, and that's the entire reason I'm here. Yeah. Okay. So, so your answer is uh, no, they are very different. Okay. Um, can we, John, can we launch poll three uh, just to get the audience perspective as well? So um, you will see a poll here. Let's take 30 seconds if you guys can vote quickly. And this would be interesting. So Clark, you are also a demand gen marketer, right? So what do you think about increased targeting? Is it all bad? Is it partially good? What's your perspective while we are waiting for the poll? Yeah, so for, for years we have operated under, I gotta move this poll. If we have data that we are executing on in any specific demand generation campaign, uh, if those, um, have been identified at the personal level, yeah, you should be working on first party in intent data and anybody that has has opted in. However, what, what we're talking about here, and this is where the, there's not, I don't really see the parallels, is what RB2B is doing is completely shirking eth uh, ethical responsibility when it comes to uh, the level of privacy that people expect, you know, it, it doesn't, uh, it, it still works. If you don't have a cookie banner, there's no way that, that you guys can verify the, the content on the page, whether someone is actually using one or not. And so what it boils down to is respect for the audience and in demand generation campaigns and RB2B, I, I don't really see those parallels. I like, I, I get where you're going. Um, but any demand generation campaign should be actioned on data that has very clearly self-identified and know what they're actually getting into. Thank you. So we have uh, the poll results. About 57% people think uh, marketing use cases are more legit. Um, moving on, Adam, do you have anything to add to this before I move on to the next segment? No. Okay, excellent. Next segment. So, Clark, we'll talk about cookies data in 
particular out of this data privacy. So we live in a world where my refrigerator is spying on me, right? It tells me if I run out of eggs and I step out to a grocery store to buy egg and I get 500 of my pictures taken and uploaded to some random clouds, right? And, and yet I'm, I'm comfortable with that because I need my eggs. You are very worried about cookies data, internet cookies. And the way I look at cookies, uh, and I know there's a lot of debate around that, uh, um, it is another piece of data uh, similar to screen recording, uh, Adam mentioned from Hotjar, or behavioral tracking, um, identity resolution that we discussed from security companies, which you say is a different intent. Where do you, why, I mean, this is how the internet works. So where do you draw the line? Or how do you look at one data being more of a security concern than others? All right, long walk for a short drink of water. Um, are, are you implying that, I just wanna make sure that I understand the question correctly. Are you implying that you purchasing a refrigerator that you know its sole purpose is to do exactly what you described is in any way similar to identifying someone on a website when they have no idea that it's even happening and you don't even, uh, you're not even required to give them uh, the option to even opt out? Are you saying that yes. those two things are the yes. same? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. Everybody that uses the internet knows how internet works and all of these data comes with a cookie banner or some notification, some terms of agreement, privacy policies. So I don't see any difference, but that, feel free to disagree. That's extremely unsettling because okay. it, because what you just said is, Santosh, you were the one to purchase that refrigerator. So you knew that the point of those particular features on that refrigerator were to do those things for you. That's what those additional features were for. You knew it was going to have data on your food and, you know, whatever. And the point is to uh, get it to order new things for you. So in a sense, you consented to that the second you swiped credit card. In our B2B's case, I have, I don't have the option to consent. I don't have the option to opt out. Just, just walking in the store, glancing around at refrigerators, not purchasing anything, not giving you my information at all, and certainly not declaring any kind of intent to buy. You're saying that, that it's okay for someone to then at that point, if I just walk in the store, turn around and walk out, for someone to show up at my front door and go, hey, heard you were looking for a fridge, Clark. That's not in any way similar. That is not at all the same thing. Okay. Thank you, Adam. Clark says there's no consent to people who are using RB2B. Do you want to address that? So we we do, you know, you install the PLG script. The only thing you see is change your privacy policy to say exactly this. And I think most of our users do that. We strongly suggest people use a cookie consent banner uh, and we're coming up with ways to do that and have more, what do you, whatever you want to call it, adherence to that practice. Uh, we can argue about whether a cookie consent banner with very conspicuous language is uh, a dark path or not, but like we want people to use this in a way to where they are they have an ability to not be tracked, right? Like that, that is the goal. Um, and we're moving that way. How, what are you doing? We're, we're gonna, we're, we, we will, we will make ways that like defaults to having cookie banners on people's sites when they install the script, basically. How can you verify that? Uh, if it's part of our script, it's just gonna be part of how our B2B works. Right. That's what you just said. How technically 
can you verify the content on someone's page? I mean, if it's built into the script and it brings up the content, then we control it. Right. You just said that for a third time. Like, we'll just do it. That's just like, we'll just do, we'll do the thing. We'll just make it happen. How? I'm like, not we'll sure you understand that the, the consent needed on their end to give you the ability to do that. What is it? What do they have to do? We'll talk to our lawyers. I would strongly suggest that. Cool. All right. Antosh, cut the so, cut the tension with a knife in here, please. Ooh. Yeah, yes, yes, let's do that. <laughs> so um, I think uh, Adam's position that as long as marketers are using a cookie consent banner uh, and users see a pop-up and agree or disagree, uh, it's on them. And once they disagree, uh, the script knows not to follow through and de-anonymize and, and so on. Um, um, all right, so moving on. So let's talk about uh, how, how we're doing in time. Okay. The role of large companies uh, when they look at privacy. So you have said in one of your posts that big companies are not that dumb to build contact level resolution. And yet several big companies, uh, including Google and Facebook and HubSpot to some extent, are doing contact level resolution in their own ways, in their own wall garden. So how do you kind of uh, reconcile with this? Um, why is it right for Google to do, uh, but not for, let's say, others or startups to do the same? It's not. Full stop. Okay. I, I, I'm, I'm sure you're fully expecting for me to say something in complete opposition to that. Uh, no, hate them too. And that's the point. Like it's, it, let me first say that the conversation is not about them. Okay. Right. We're talking about it's RB2B. Right. right. However, I, I knew this question was coming because Adam stated it you know, several times. And that's, you know, kind of one of the go-to statements is why is it okay for them to do that? And th that's kind of the point, it, or at least part of it. When we're talking about ethical responsibility, why are we not concerned about what we do? Because we have no control over what they do. There is no possible way that any of us are on an individual level, or especially at the, uh, the startup level on any GTM team, you know, whatever. We know that we can't affect that in a meaningful way. You are fighting a losing fight. And so at the end of the day, you have to make a decision to use your powers for good or otherwise. Yeah, because because in the in the long run, if we're if we're influencing people to use what I would certainly consider worst practices in establishing a, a relationship with your audience, then that just makes you no better than them. If you want to punch up, then approach it from a step of actually being better th than them, not sinking to their level, and that's what you're doing. Yep. Great. So this leads me to the next question. Can, so, I, can I just comment quickly on that? Yes, please. So look, like, and, and I think this is like where a lot of our Clark, our, our disagreement like lies, like in, in, in this. Oh, issue. just here? Like my, my, my <laughs> view. Well, I think it like stems from this. Sure. My core view is the way that, that the internet works is this value exchange based on tracking people across websites and the more information that can be aggregated by the party doing the tracking the better the economic model works and i think that's a lot of the reason why google couldn't get rid of cookies it's like the backbone of how the economic engine of the internet works now where we really disagree is i just believe that rb2b is a new extension of that and you do not Right. Or maybe you do and you just think that it's all wrong. But like my response to that is, you know, you think that it's wrong 
in that I shouldn't be doing what I'm what I'm doing because I should take a moral position that is higher than that. Whereas my position is, I just view this as how the internet works and I want to be in the internet business. So like I'm generating commerce by, you know, sort of this mechanism of retargeting or whatever. Um, so that, 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 Adam, can I, can I, can I ask the next question? Uh, if it's quick. <laughs> I, I, it, verbosity is my love language. Um, <laughs> I can I can totally see that perspective, and and I'm sure from your point of view, that is how the internet works. But it's not how people work. It's not how vendors and audiences work. It's it's not uh, it's not what it means to actually value and respect your audience, which is proven to actually be more effective than just talking people on the internet. Yep. Yeah. So he, he, here is uh, where I'm still having a hard time aligning with your view, Clark. But uh, let me ask Adam this time. So Adam, so based on Clark's perspective, nobody should be saying sending out unsolicited cold emails in B2B. Like I personally receive hundreds a day, right? Um, in some ways, our B2B is actually uh, making this world so much better because instead of pure outbound, we are advocating inbound led outbound. If somebody visited your website, just send email to, you know, 100 or 1,000 people rather than 100,000, right? Um, what's your take? And Clark, I'll, I'll get to you to get to your response on the fact that RB2B is reducing uh, spam, not causing spam. So, you know, I hate cold calling I've grown businesses with cold calling. I hate getting cold emails. I've grown businesses with cold email. Uh, you know, I think you got to do what you got to do. Um, as far as this help, look, <laughs> I think people are going to spam less because spamming doesn't work anymore. And, and, you know, signal as a way to engage with people, you know, whether it's our signal or somebody else's signal, uh, is one of the only things you have these days. So, um, you know, acting on signal, it's, it, it certainly lowers the volume of, uh, outbound messaging by, by orders of magnitude. Um, you know, and I think it's, I think it's what's going to continue to happen, right? Like wh whether or not it's helping the spam problem, or it's like the only thing that you can do because the spam problem is so bad, whatever, that's like a debate, but, it, um, so but it it absolutely is spam. It is just spam adjacent. When you're running outbound motions on a, a process that the end user did not participate in, did not consent to, you're spamming them. It doesn't matter how you spin that or, or how you got their data, whatever. It is the exact same thing. To them, from their perspective, which is the entire basis of my entire thesis here is you're not considering your audience at all. You're doing whatever you want to do and calling it whatever you want to. And, you, and you're saying that you're making the world a better place. Like Santos, stay unbiased, please. Yes. Uh, so if, if they're not having the chance to participate in this, from their perspective, what you're doing looks exactly like what it is a spam email a spam linkedin message it is as much as you want to call it engineered serendipity you know like call it whatever you want it's spam all right thanks uh, for your input there um so one last i think and then we'll uh, uh, go to Q and A. So GDPR, let's talk about GDPR. And I'm particularly interested in um, the economic implication of GDPR in EU versus US. So just to give you some background, um, I have been dealing with GDPR since my early days, like 15 years ago when I was still in the data space, right? 
and there were a lot of uh, the way it evolved. I think it ensured that uh, EU lost out on the data economy entirely. Uh, versus, if you look at the some of the innovation or companies in the U.S. versus EU, they're like almost no data company that you can point out to. And EU is getting ready to do a GDPR level regulations for AI and test data in AI to be specific. So question for you, Clark, um, can you share your thoughts on, uh, and this is very different than data privacy question, just uh, uh, entrepreneurs, I guess, uh, uh, would love to, uh, or founders would love to hear the impact of onerous regulations like GDPR uh, versus not having in the US uh, and what impact it has on venture development and economics. Can you repeat the very end of that? I I didn't catch the very end of the question. Uh, just the impact of these regulations on venture development, economics, uh, uh, between EU, US. GDPR protects in users. It's right. regulations at the federal, whatever you want to call the equivalent level. Right. The fact that we don't have that yet uh, in the United States is a travesty. I mean, it, honestly, you know, whatever adjective you want to call it. Yeah. Um, sure. it, it, there's a reason that we went from zero to now 20 different states that have enacted their own uh, data privacy uh, sure. legislation. You know, there are at least 10 more that have uh, drafted and filed in 2024 alone. So uh, regardless of whether or not we're we're moving towards that at the federal level or not, um, it, it just goes to show that uh, even at the state level, um, it's time for a change and everyone knows it and they're not going to wait around uh, for it to happen at the federal level. So, you know, say what you will, you know, com compare us and, and where we are um, with GDPR all you want to. At the end of the day, the conversation's moot because it doesn't apply to us. Yep, makes sense. Adam? Do you have a perspective on the impact of uh, regulations like GDPR on, on economic activity between EU and US? I mean, my only uh, comment is that I will abide by the laws. You know, uh, I, 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 and so will my customers. So, um, you know, I eagerly anticipate uh, what's coming down the pipe. <clears throat> Great, thanks. Any closing remarks, either of you, before we start taking the question? And John, if you can start putting together poll tool. Clark, thank you for coming on. Yeah, man. Um, yeah, let's take some questions. Yeah, we can do that. Sure. <laughs> I have a question. Ask away. Okay, Why, go ahead. In the poll, what was the decision not to include a neither or both option? <laughs> well, that really wasn't good. intentional. <laughs> um, I thought most people will do one or the other. Maybe the next time we'll consider that. Um, sometimes so, you get asked some questions. Yeah. So what's Clark's ideal state for the internet? He has mentioned a lot about cookies, consent, privacy. What is the ultimate internet utopia for Clark? The ultimate internet utopia? I, that, that's a concept that um, is not really worth discussing, to be, to be perfectly honest with you, because it will, it, it will never happen. Like to a certain degree, you have to you have to be a realist, just like Adam said. That's the way mm -hmm. the internet works. Like the hive mind is going to do what the hive mind does, but in no uncertain terms should we 
completely forego taking a cold, hard look in the mirror and trying to practice some deep introspection and a little bit of self-awareness that will hopefully at the end of the day establish a, a better connection with our audience, with our buyers. And if, if we can't, if we can't do that, if we continue to do things that they 100% objectively hate when they find out that, you know, they, they've been identified without their consent, we, we, we have to stay away from garbage like that. Um, you know, I'm in the game of building long-term sustainable brands. And so if, if we can all work towards speaking out against things that don't benefit have, or have no inherent benefit whatsoever to our actual audience um, and actively deceives them for our own gain. Um, if we're, if we can get to a point where we start talking out against practices like that more, we'll start to move the needle in, in a direction. And I, I think that uh, utopia is a pipe dream. The, the best we can do is what we can control. Thank you. Adam, any perspective on internet utopia? Uh, you know, I, I have expressed I think... my view of, of the internet and how I believe that it works. Uh, and if for better or for worse, right? There's uh, rivers of ink spilled about the travesties that have resulted of the current state of the internet. And, uh, you know. Yeah. It's just the so, world we live in. There's many new questions coming in. And Clark, yeah, a lot of them are directed to you. Yeah. So one of them is, by the way, there's a Supreme Court judgment on when the data industry started. This was in 70s or 80s uh, in the US, um, where, and Arun brought this up, uh, where if you hand over a business card, let's say to anyone, one business card, that's like sharing your data to the whole world because you can't control from there onwards, right? If somebody takes that data and puts it on a CD-ROM or internet and, and passes it around, his question is, once you visit a website, can you control if they try to identify and, and communicate back uh, to you with an offer? It's no different than installing a security camera outside your home uh, uh, that takes pictures to pass a by, right? You're not getting consent from people walking past. So how do you uh, reconcile with these different uh, you, scenarios? That argument is completely invalid because you said it at the very beginning, you're the one that handed them your business card. You did that. You volunteered your information to that person. Now, of course, you can't control what they're going to do with it. If, if they then sell that data, that's on, that's on them. If they didn't disclose what they were going to do with your business card data, that's on them. But in the very beginning, at the beginning of, of that you know, transaction, as it were, you consented. You self-identified, which is completely different. than What about the you, ring door, doorbell example as well, which is part of the same question? Uh, in, in installing a security camera in your home I mean, and I'm, monitoring. I mean, I'm trying to find it, yeah. It's from Arun Pillai. I, I guess, I mean, it's, <laughs> I mean, what a, what a wild outlying case, you know, I, I would, I Is would it definitely, outline? I mean, every I mean, house has one of these. I mean, sure, but I, that's one of those questions I would definitely defer to somebody else on, like a lawyer. Okay. And and if I can, real quick, I noticed that uh, Aaron right above that uh, pointed okay. out um, that deployronin.com, which is our website, uh, currently doesn't have a privacy policy or cookie policy on it. And okay. uh, it, uh, this individual inspected the page and found our B2B's cookies. Everybody can go ahead and put that card back in the deck. Yes, we've been testing it for some time now in preparation for 
exactly this. And the interesting thing is that whenever RB2B actually identified someone, what we did is we then immediately reached out and disclosed exactly what happened, which is ethical disclosure, just like a security researcher uh, finding a vulnerability. They then, they then ethically disclose it to that company, which is exactly the same practice that we were doing. We disclosed what had happened, how we got their information, and, and basically conducted our own research. Um, to say the very least, no one was happy, and that's putting it lightly. Adam, do you have a, so were you using it for did marketing you, did, purpose? Did, did you get any business off it? No. <laughs> no. Everybody, I mean, to, to be for perfectly honest with you, um, we, uh, you know, we, we laugh about it, but literally every single person that, that we reached out to and disclosed, like, we're testing out our B2B. Here's our stance on it. We want to see how you as a B2B buyer, you know, whoever it may be, feels about exactly what happened here. Um, the fact that it, the, the fact that we were able to identify exactly who you are and able to reach out with you without you filling out a form, consenting, downloading a thing, clicking a banner, we still got your information and you had no clue. Every, several people told me exactly where I could shove it. And it was uh, the most insulting validation for my own argument that I've ever had. Uh, I, I would counter and say that your your audience of CISOs is probably a little bit, you know, in, in one side of this that uh, that most of our customers are not. Uh, sure, my my ICP is not CISOs; yeah. it's marketers. But like you, you, your niche is security companies, correct? Like, right? It, it, yeah. Well, I still think some. Yeah, of I mean, it's, it's still biased, more, right? I mean, is, is is more likely to have a staunch sort of like, uh, you know, opinion on this then. Yeah, they, they have an economic yeah. incentive to kind of have that position, <laughs> just like RB2B has an economic incentive to have this. So there's no, uh, I mean, there's no other way to look at it. I, I completely understand that perspective. You're just further validating my claim that you're willing to invalidate what your audience is actually saying. So uh, yeah, I completely understand where that would be your perspective. So here is another question for you, Clark. Do you foresee legislation at some point that breaks down these wall gardens of big online companies to adhere to what you call ethical business practice uh, that shape how we move forward with privacy? Um, yeah, there's more stuff, but let's uh, let's just get your perspective on that. Do you see- Are you, are you asking if I can predict the future? The answer to that is no. Well, um, the, the way- uh, everyone is reporting on growing concerns, legislation being drafted and passed in the states. Uh, every single piece of data out there says that um, it's only going to get more stringent when it when it comes to uh, compliance regulations, data privacy laws. Uh, that's certainly where it's trending. Okay, thanks. Another one, <laughs> again for you, from Lindsay. And I'm not aware of this, so you'll have to uh, understand. So, Clark, what are your thoughts on the FCC's new one-on-one -on -one consent requirement and its application to this discussion? Um, I'm not entirely sure yet. I want, I want to love it, but there, there's some really, there's a lot of nuance there that I'm still exploring. Um, more than happy to to discuss that and. Learn more, and that that's an SMS law, right? Just to clarify, I just googled. Ah, it. okay. Is that, yep. what is that what we're talking about? The SMS yep. law. Okay. Okay. Excellent. <clears throat> yeah, there, there's a lot of things in it that it doesn't um, state outright, like the the nuances around the the collection, the practices, how it's you know whatever. You know, I, I think it as part of the way that that is drafted, it, it leaves a lot to be desired. Okay, this is a good question. So Adam, let's uh, uh, maybe point this to you. So yeah. the question is, doesn't capitalism take care of this whole discussion, right? If customers don't want what you call 
spam, then they're just simply not going to buy from that brand. And people will ultimately stop using these solutions. Well, look, I, I think that that's Clark's argument. You know, uh, it, the first thing that he said was, I'm a brand builder. Um, I don't think that a core tenant of building brand is being deceptive to your audience. Uh, and that's where the argument, in my opinion, that's where Clark's argument starts even more than the sort of like, you know, how is RB2B's privacy implications different than, you know, the company level where you know exactly the persons are, are right? Like, again, that's right. what I heard Clark say, the first and sort of most important thing. Uh, you know, then the, the question comes to me, it's like, well, do you agree with that? It's like, I'm a huge brand guy. I mean, the only thing that I spend my time on is brand related activity. Uh, you know, I happen to include this as a, I don't know, 5% part of our go to market motion because it works. But like, I just don't, you know, I, I, I don't feel that the two ideas are mutually exclusive that like, you know, and, and I also just think it, man, it's getting so hard that you just have to do what works to survive these days, right? And it's like, if I'm an American entrepreneur and you're showing me a legal way to acquire customers that works on a repeated basis, I'm gonna do that. Well, I, you know, and like, that's just the camp that I'm in as an entrepreneur where it was so different from how Clark sees the yeah. world and why this is an interesting debate, right? Like- Yeah, because uh, my, my perspective is that that is an incredibly- short-term myopic way of thinking that is not going to actually build a long-term sustainable brand. You're, you're, you're better off having internal discussions about your own KPIs and what growth actually means. And I know you're going to agree with me on this, uh, telling VCs to kiss your ass. Yeah. So this is a good segue uh, for another question, Clark. So somebody, Mike Tastel is asking, so as a CEO of your company, how have you reached your customer in the past, present, and future? And how do you avoid like no consent uh, uh, so far? 100% of Ronan's clientele is built off of founder-led growth, inbound from my LinkedIn content. We do zero okay. out, we do zero outbound whatsoever. All right, I'm looking for more questions. Please keep dropping. Okay, here's a new one. I don't understand it, so. <laughs> I do. Yeah, pick pick one, uh, Clark, if you <laughs> find something as I'm looking for. No, I, so, I don't, I, I don't. Here, here's another one. Go ahead. Here's another one um, that is asking about what's your perspective about LinkedIn profile viewers? And before you say that they gave you consent or, or anybody on LinkedIn for that matter uh, to reach out. Yeah, it's, it's like LinkedIn has some consent policies that nobody reads or understands. And uh, so how do you reach out to people? You, you mentioned uh every, all, all your uh customers are coming from linkedin so can you uh, deep dive into it just just so people understand what you mean there's some confusion around whether you can reach out to people that comment on you on linkedin as well or is that similar to outbound it's a social network that that is what's implied is is engaging with people on a social network so you're saying so, this is how internet works or this is how social network works. So it's okay. Yes. Th that is <laughs> the, the implied agreement with everybody that signs up for a social network. Adam, do you want to add anything here? The, the implied agreement of people who use social networks. So it's okay. Look, this is just how I believe that the internet works, period, social network or not. So like, I'm not the one who's going to argue with, with this point, right? Like, um, yeah, I want to read one that somebody else brought my attention to Clark that they just want to hear you defend. 
Uh, I'll just say that it's wild that Clark preaches ethics. A little while ago, he made a video criticizing some content we made at Lavender. I trolled him a little, and he wanted a war path to get me fired. I'd already put it in my notice, hence why I was willing to troll. LOL. When I did leave Lavender, he made several comments saying, I did that, I'm proud. He then went on a live show with some cyber weirdos and laughed at uh, when one of them said that they'd like to hurt me slash drop bombs on my house. Guys un unhinged, I'm fine, no bombs yet, but threats of violence on me and my family aren't ethical regardless of what sarcastic joke provoked you. First of all, do you know what he's talking about? Hey, Will. How are you? So you do. Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay. Uh, of course I know. Now is not remotely the time or place for that. Like, congratulations, you you got your dopamine hit. Um, I won't be addressing that at all. Next. Okay. You got any, Santosh? Well, as people are still putting in, um, so both uh, Adam and Clark, do you have a perspective on Google's U-turn on third-party cookies? I want to go first. My perspective is they couldn't take them away because that's the way the internet works. <laughs> okay. I'll pass it to Clark. Clark. <sighs> that's fair i mean uh, like i said like the, the hive mind is is w what it is i mean th this goes back to just not being able to affect things in a meaningful way other than like what we can personally control um yeah i i can see that perspective for sure I, I don't know if we addressed this, Clark. Uh, I think we may have uh, alluded to it, but there, there was a question. What's your take on uh, cold outbound, outbound in general? Just the kind of outbound that you see from Apollo, Zoom Info, uh, and, and many other data companies, right? To be more specific, like obviously they do so, it. So, so, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, but just just trying to be specific here, um, a bulk of the outrage is done where you go to one of these data tools, and there are like literally fifty of them out there, some very big companies uh, like Zoom Info, and then you create a list, and then you send out uh, email using outreach or sales loft, or so on. Right, sure. D the data that's used throughout this process doesn't have any opt-ins or consent from the data subject. Right. Um, it's uh, um, people find this data online or some. So what's your and, and there are literally billions of dollars or if not tens of billions of dollars being spent on some part of this value chain, whether through companies like Salesloft and Outreach and uh, Lemlist and a few others or through data companies like Zoom Info, Apollo, Lucia, Rocket Reach and a few others. Right. And there's a lot of automation like AI. Uh, so there are thousands of companies in this overall space. There's no consent whatsoever uh, from individual or very little, if, if any. Uh, what's your perspective? I think somebody asked a question that's kind of sounds like it's related to this. Uh, yeah, I saw it. Uh, it yeah, same perspective. It, everyone does not like cold outreach. And it, of course, it still happens. And of, of course, I 100% understand why you would want to throw zoom info and in whoever the the data for the most part everyone knows is garbage um the the most value that's in anyone's pipeline is first party intent based off of value that they have actually given their audience um you know if if you think you're going to scrape a bunch of leads and have it turn into some monstrous pipeline you know those days are over I Thanks, kind of, Adam. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, I agree with Clark. Those days are over. But, you know, we're both growing our businesses the same way. You just don't like what I'm selling. <laughs> You're exactly right. You know, that's it. <laughs> everything, everything else, we everything else, we agree on. Yeah. <clears throat>
Excellent. So Clark, uh, uh, just winding this down now. Um, so apart from security, you have a, a demand gen uh, background. Uh, so take us into the future, say five years from now, and uh, tell us how you see demand gen or how the world might evolve um, where uh, or how demand gen might evolve uh, specifically in your perspective. It's a little bit like that Utopia Internet uh, uh, question, but more around sure. demand gen and yeah, thanks. Yeah, I, I think that the the future of demand generation in general is is going to evolve into something more true to form, like actually generating mm -hmm. demand. Um, you know, demand right. gen for a lot of people is um, is brand is inbound being being the result mm -hmm. of it um you know we've we've seen that trending for uh some time now and if if you're if you're thinking that you're going to run demand gen campaigns and it solely be paid ads you're going to lose like you're going to have right. to try harder and so uh when it comes to like demand gen that term in in a bubble um you know five years from now it's going to look nothing like what it does today if nice. it's even if it's even called that yeah i like it i i think it's kind of aligned with the way i look at it at least adam your perspective yeah, I, I i agree with that completely uh you know i i think um i'm stealing this from from this from chris walker a little bit he said like it's not demand gen it's demand creation and demand capture and mm -hmm. Uh, you know, a paid ad is more or less demand capture. You're not originating the desire for technology through showing someone a paid ad, right? Like that demand origination and demand creation happened somewhere in the ether, uh, you know, either through some word of mouth or some thought leadership. Uh, and I think, you know, we're, we are now in B2B, we are living in an era where this, you know, whatever, whatever you want to call it, this like personal brand, founder brand, you know, LinkedIn content creation or whatever, uh, it is the creating content that your prospects actually would consume if you weren't selling them anything is over time is the single most powerful and efficient demand creation engine that has ever existed. And it will only get more powerful as more and more different uh, personas of people get on LinkedIn. Um, and I think that that's what it's going to look like in five years, right? Like it's not going to be like, it's becoming, I think not an option now, but like, I think it's just going to be what people are doing in five. It's going to be what is understood as you know, the way that, uh, that you do this, you know, the way that you sell software is that right. Or the way that you sell services is that way. So I think Clark and I are actually quite aligned there. Um, Great, thank you. There was uh, one more comment or question from John Kosturos. Uh, he said this a couple of times, so let me uh, mention it. He's talking about uh, the use of higher resolution or targeting to improve attribution uh, and why that's important uh, to reduce wastage in demand gen. Any quick response, Clark? You're having the wrong conversation. Okay. Your, audi your audience doesn't want to do things and take actions that fit what your traditional attribution models are going to uh, serve and, and look pretty um, in a slide deck presenting to people that have set these arbitrary uh, goals and needing attribution at every step of, of the way. That is not the way human beings work. You know, if, if you're... If you're trying to um, completely shed light on every part of their journey and regardless of what type of attribution model uh, you you want to use, you have to understand that you're not you're not marketing to personas, you're marketing to human beings and trying to nail down um, exactly the the silver bullet of when they converted, when they were brand unaware, when they were brand aware, just like demand, traditional demand generation, those those notions are not long for this world. 
You're going to have to try thank harder. You. Great. Hey, Clark, thank you for your time. This was a terrific conversation and loved every bit of it. Uh, and uh, there are many uh, topics where we totally agree with you. Adam, do you want to wind this up for and talk about the next week? Clark, I just want to say thanks for being such a great customer. <laughs> Uh, yeah, who, who does that? <laughs> yeah, you can you can say that now. Rest assured, that shit's coming off my page the second we hang up. Uh, who is next week? Who do we who, who do we have? I, I don't even remember. I should know this. Okay, I don't know. We got a good guest next uh, week. It's uh oh yeah, we're gonna have Rob Clark talk about our uh our that's our right. our non human support bot workflows and uh whatever what uh. No, Clark's the sixth, uh, Rob's on the 13th, and then uh, our, yeah, that's what's next. Um, when's Aaron Ross coming on? Oh yeah, we gotta reach back out to him. He, he'll probably be uh, he'll probably be in October or November. I booked a bunch of other guests that are like awesome, so. Um, yeah. Anyway, Clark, Great. Hey, thanks With a lot, this? man. It was a, it was a uh, I think a fruitful chat. I think everybody loved how awkward it was. And uh, <laughs> it, makes, it makes great content. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, it, it was a long time coming. Glad we finally uh, hashed it out, even though absolutely nothing was hashed out. But I mean, for the most part, I, I think, you know, based on our, our private conversations, we're both pretty aware that we have very similar brains. I, yeah. You know, as, as a person, I think you're awesome. Uh, hey, sell something else. Just do better. Yeah. That's it. Hey, I, I appreciate it. I'm I'm glad it didn't uh, devolve into us talking about like golf's, you know, handicaps and shit like that. That was what I was worried about. I was like, man, this just can't be this like presidential debate. Like it, it, you know, it needs to stay civil. So thank you for, uh, you know, being respectful and, uh, you know, keeping it, keeping it real. I think everybody appreciate it. Yeah, man. Thanks a lot, guys. Uh, cheers. Cool. Appreciate it. Thanks. Take care.